Hello everyone, welcome back to Chemistry CC for you. So we have been working on certain exams which we haven't covered before, starting with Kerala State Eligibility Test for Chemical Sciences. So this is a teacher's eligibility test. And uh, if, the, if there is any other exam request that you want us to cover, please ask us in the comment section below. So let's start. So we are starting with the Kerala set uh, chemical sciences previous question, part one. You start from a small regular basic questions which are useful for every other examination. And also specifically the questions as far as I have said, these are in the MSc level of questions. So you can use it for other MSc entrances as well. Let's begin. The first question over here is that the resistance of mercury drops to zero when it cool when it is cooled to. So we have to say at the temperature at which the resistance will be cooled to uh, zero. So the temperature is point, uh, 4.2 Kelvin. And the reason behind that is the mercury becomes superconductor at 4.2 Kelvin. And at that temperature, its resistance becomes zero. And what is a superconductor? That is something important to keep in mind. So a superconductor is a substance that can conduct the electricity without any resistance when it becomes colder than a critical temperature. And it behaves very different because electrons can move very freely at this temperature. Now, this question can be asked in three different ways. One, as shown in the question. Second, we can be asked, what is the critical temperature of Hg? And also, what temperature does uh, mercury becomes a superconductor? So all the three answers is the same, this 4.2 Kelvin. Now the second question, which are the amino acids which contain sulfur? So this is a very straightforward question and the answer is option D, cysteine and methionine. To answer this question, it is extremely important that you know the structures of all the amino acids. And there is an easy way to uh, learn this. We have doing many shortcuts. You can look at the shortcuts in bio biochemistry that we have done before. I'll be putting the link in the description box. So uh, amino acids specifically, you have to learn things like uh, where there are specific atoms like sulfur. For example, here you can see in cysteine and methionine. Then you need to know the positively charged ones, the negatively charged ones, very important. Then the ones with aromatic rings. So these will be extremely important for you uh, at an examination point of view because this is interesting to ask as a question. So please memorize at least the structures of these amino acids. It is, it is something you can which can easily give you some marks because the names are easy to remember and I will do a shortcut video on this very soon. Now let's see. Third question is the number of alpha and beta particles emissions involved in the transformation of U23892 to uh, 20682. So as you know, this is the uh, atomic number and the one above is a mass number. So there are a few points you need to understand to answer this question. The first point is that a single alpha particle reduces the mass number, which is represented by the letter A by four, and the atomic number can be reduced by two. So the atomic number notation is a Z. Now, the second point is that beta particles keep the mass number A the same. It will not make any change in the mass number, but it can it will increase the atomic number by one. So here, when the there is alpha particle emission, there is a reduction in the both mass number and atomic number, but beta particle, there is an increase in the atomic number. So these two things you have to keep in mind. So initially, let's consider the number of alpha particles emitted. For this, we can specifically consider the mass number because there is no change in the mass number when there is a beta particle emission. Just to find the number of alpha particles, let's consider the reduction in mass number. So from changing U238 to PB206, the total number of change in the mass is uh, 32. So the number of alpha particles will be equal to the mass reduced divided by 4. Why is this divided by 4? Because a single alpha particle reduces it by 4. So 32 by 4, which gives us 8. Now here there are three different options which has 8 alpha particles. So one of these should be the answer. Now let's consider the beta particles. Now reduction in the atomic number by the alpha particles should be 8 into 2, which is 16 because we have eight alpha particles, which is already established and it reduces the atomic number by two. So the total reduction should have been 16. That is 92 minus 16, 
it should have been 76 but the final atomic number is 82 it means some beta particles have been emitted which increase the number of uh, increase the atomic number so uh, for that if we can consider if we are considering we can write uh, 82 minus uh, 76 and it gives us six beta particles now we got the answer as option b 8 alpha and uh, 6 beta now the point I will explain here once more. Single alpha particle reduces mass number by 4 and atomic number by 2. Beta particle increases the atomic number by 1. So in any question like this, initially you need to find the alpha particles by uh, finding the change in mass number. So once you do the change in mass number, divide it by 4 to find the number of alpha particles. Next, uh, try to understand how much change should be should have been made in the, um, how much change is made by the alpha particle emission into the atomic number and see what is the difference. Those many beta particles would be emitted. So this is how we are dealing with the nuclear chemistry kind of question where an alpha and beta particle number of questions are asked. Next, this is from statistical mechanics. So, micro canonical ensembles are characterized by the same. So, this is conceptual question. So, that is why I have covered this because I want you people to know the concepts related to ensembles and what does their name mean. So, micro canonical ensemble is a statistical ensemble that represents the possible states of a mechanical system whose total energy is exactly specified. So, here if you look at there should be total energy should be specified. So, only one option is there which shows the total energy. So, that itself is the answer option A. NVE. So, an NVE kind of ensemble is known as a micro canonical ensemble. Now, NVE is micro canonical, NVT is a canonical, but there should be a thermodynamic tem temperature equilibria should be there. So, those kind. Then, uh, new, uh, mu VT, then we have NPH, then we have NPT. So this is gan canonical, isoenthalpic isobaric and isothermal isobaric. So I want you people to memorize this right now. I'll take a class on what these are in the coming days. But right now, please try to write this down and memorize this because this is kind of questions are repeated in this exam. So this is one. Now let's move on to the next question. The cryoscopic constant for water is 1.86 K kilogram per mole. At what temperature at 0 0.1 molar molar KCL will freeze. So initially this is cryoscopic constant and we need to look at the particular formula delta Tf equal to Kf into M. So this M is molality and delta Tf actually means the freezing temperature of a pure solvent minus the freezing point uh, temperature after the addition of the solute. So this is equal to cryoscopic constant plus uh, multiplied by M. So uh, this we will just uh, look at how this can be calculated. Now let's continue. So we know the temperature of a freezing temperature of the pure solvent. Considering it as water, we know the pure solvent it is 273 Kelvin. So now let's substitute over here for delta Ta. Tf, it should be 273 Kelvin minus Tf. So we the question is to con, con, find this Tf over here. So we have delta Tf is equal to 273 Kelvin minus Tf. Now let's substitute it over in this equation. Our cryoscopic constant Kf is given already, which is 1.86. So 273 minus Tf is equal to 1.86 into 0.1. So Tf is equal to 273 minus 0 0.186, which is 272.814 Kelvin. But if you look carefully over here, your answer should be in degree Celsius. So to make it into degree Celsius, what we do, we just minus this by 273. Okay. So 273 minus 273 gives you uh, minus 0 0.186 degrees Celsius, which is option A. So what we did, delta Tf equal to Kf into M. And uh, for the pure solvent, we have taken Tf0 as 273 Kelvin. We found the Tf by use, substituting the other constants, which are already given in the examination. So this uh, particular answer is in Kelvin. To convert it into degree Celsius, we minus subtract it by 273. Thereby, we are getting our answer as minus 0 0.186 degrees Celsius. Now, let's move on to the next question. Among the hydrogen halides, which is the most powerful reducing agent? The option is option D, HI. 
and the answer is that it is the strongest reducing agent because of the low bond this lowest bond dissociation energy one it is because of the size if you look at the size it, uh, it's the largest size is hi and it is easier to remove it and i minus is a really good leaving group so all these factors together make uh, the low, low bond dissociation energy to be extremely small and thereby this is becoming a strong reducing agent so we have done a video on p block elements before where we have covered all these kinds of trends like acidity, how the acidity varies, how the redux, reducing power, oxidizing power varies for all the p-block elements. So you can look at it. That is a very simple video where you can cover almost all the points in, in a few seconds. So I'll give the link in the description box. Please try to cover it in the uh, by the end of your examination. Now let's move ahead. So this is the next question. Choose the correct statement given below. MN3O4 is an inverse spinal, CO3O4 is a normal spinal, Fe3O4 is a normal spinal, none of this. So we need to find the correct statement. So in order to find this correct statement, we need to know what is spine, inverse spinal and what is a normal spinal. Now let's see, a normal spinal have a general formula, A, B to X4. So what is this A? What is this B? So A would be having an oxidizing state of 2 and it's a divalent cation like plus 2 like cation where Mg2 plus Cr2 plus Mn2 plus this kind of a cation and the B should be something of plus 3 type which is like Al3 plus uh, Ti3 plus B V3 plus this kind and X can be anything like oxygen, sulfur, etc. So this the spinal should have a general formula of Ab to X4 and the common examples is Mg Al2 O4 and uh, Mn3 O4 then we have ZNFE2O4, then FECR2O4, etc. Now, from here itself, it is clear that uh, MN2O4 is a uh, normal spinal. So, this first option is definitely not true. So, let's cut this off. The second is about inverse spinal. So, an inverse spinal is like B, then in a, B, O4. So this A plus 2 would occupy one half of the octahedral voids, whereas one half of the B3 is occupying one by eighth of the tetrahedral and other in the oct octahedral sides. So therefore, it is like B3 is in the tetrahedral, A2 is in the uh, A2 and B3, half of the other set of the B3 is in octahedral void and O4. So the main examples are Fe3O4, COFE2O4 and NiFe2O4. So this is also not a correct statement because Fe3O4 is an inverse spinal. So the option over here is either none of these are true or CO3O4 is a normal spinal. So actually this answer is true. CO3O4 is a normal spinal and there are many reasons for this which we will cover in the D block elements explanation. But you have to remember that this is an example of a normal spinal. So the examples of normal spinal what we identified over here, MN3O4, ZNFE2O4, FECR2O4 and CO3O4 are all normal spinals and the examples of inverse spinal are ferrite, COFE2O4 and nife 2 o So these things and the meaning of the spinal should be memorized. Now we will uh, explain more on this on the context of uh, how the octahedral filling is done, tetrahedral fillings. Those kinds of problems will be discussed later on. Now the next question is, the reaction involved in the transformation of cyclohexanone oxime to capnolactam is. So this is the last stage conversion of a even bigger reaction, which is called the Beckman rearrangement. So basically Beckman rearrangement starts from a cyclohexanone and when it re reacts with NH2OH, it gives you an oxime, which further on the reaction with sulfuric acid gives you caprolactam. So this is how it happens. And it's an easier way. You just remove, actually you're just removing H2O, this O and uh, the H2 over here and you get NIOs and further H2SO4 comes and there is a ring rearrangement to form a seven membered ring called caprolactam. And the, as I said, the reaction is known as Beckman rearrangement and starts from an exenol to, uh, through an oxime reach the caprolactam. The product of this particular reaction is 
So this is a very, very peculiar reaction and very important name reaction. We have uh, covered the Beckman reaction and this particular name reaction in a previous video. I'll give the link of all the organic name reactions we have covered so far in the description box. Please do watch that. It will be easy for you to cover. All the videos are short and we have covered like uh, 10 reactions in 20 minutes. So it will, it will be easier for you to memorize along with the mechanism and the illustrative examples. So this forms option A is the correct answer. So the how this is run is uh, arenes are converted into cyclohexadienes. So here you can see this is cyclohexadiene. The, carbo the carboxylic acid group is retained, but uh, the benzene ring that is becoming now a cyclohexadiene. So this is uh, what this reduction does. And instead of uh, sodium, it can sometimes be lithium as well. And this is a free radical mechanism. We will discuss that we have already discussed the mechanism before. I'll give the link in the description box. Please do watch. Now, this is the last question that we are going to deal with today. We have to match the following fuels and their combination. This is a very common kind of question asked in many MSE entrances as well. So water gas is mainly carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And this is made by passing steam over an incandescent coke. So this carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So we know A is 2. So we, that is something we understood. Now producer gas is a low grade fuel and it is combination of nitrogen and carbon monoxide. So we got this over here. And how is this formed? Again, it is formed by passing air or steam through red hot carbon. Third, a marsh gas is a methane. Marsh gas is just methane and this is generated from decaying marshes. It is uh, as the name suggests. Obviously, therefore, coal gas is a mixture of hydrogen, methane and uh, hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide also because it is a side product and it is obtained by destructive distillation of coal and formed by form use, uh, formerly used for lighting and heating. Now let's see. So A belongs to two, B belongs to one. So either of these options. Then C is four and D is three. So our option D is the right answer. So these kinds of things can be memorized. Very easy to remember and important to memorize as well. Now let's uh, stop the video today in here. We will continue in the next video and any other examination queries or any request you have, please write in the comment section. We'll be doing more uh, lecture lecture series as well in the coming days. Uh, let's meet, meet soon. Thank you everyone. Have a great day.